going to talk to you guys a little, today a little bit about coexistence of content management systems, in, especially in universities, since that seems to be a, an area where you will find a lot of content management systems. My name is Calvin Hendricks Parker, and I am also one of the co-founders of Six Feet Up and the CTO there. I've been involved with the Plone community uh, for what seems like nearly ages, um, but since about 2003, and doing Zope even before that. So at lunchtime, we were reminiscing about the old days of Zope uh, prior to even Plone existing. But here's some of the things, you know, we, we've been working with Plone for, like I said, quite a while, helping lots of organizations work through their content management needs. But, you know, as we know, years ago, you know, content marketing is kind of what has drawn or driven a lot of these sites. So we're dealing with tons and tons of messages about content marketing, and basically, you know, the, the content is king. But if we fast forward, you know, we've, we've, we've heard that for a long time. What's happened is now they've proliferated. Uh, sites, websites have uh, grown and they, they have uh, populated and multiplied. So, and not only have they populated and multiplied uh, with one technology, but in other technologies too. So not only kittens, but we also get puppies. But who, in, okay, so in the room here, uh, who here is at a university? Okay, well, a good, good number of here in university. Now who here has more than five sites at their university? More than 10 sites, 50 sites, 100 sites, yeah. So there's, there's some universities with greater demand than others at this. But then in, in that same kind of questioning is, who here is using just one CMS for all those sites? <laughs> they got one. <laughs> At least that you're responsible for, right? So not only are we dealing with lots of sites, but we're also dealing with lots of different technologies. Uh, so basically, we, we're ending up with, there's lots of potential points for content publishing. We're having lots of scattered web assets. And if you add all this up, we end up with you know, potentially inconsistent branding which to visitors to the sites or people who are looking for that content makes it hard for them to, it gives them a poor experience. It's hard for them to find the information they're looking for. They're not sure if they're looking at the canonical sources of certain kinds of information. But not only are we talking about sites, uh, for example, you know, we have more than one site in a lot of universities. We actually found that out of, in 2014, that of, 69% of the universities who run Plone were also seeing Drupal uh, sites at those universities. So, and which is also, you know, Drupal's become a very large player in the content management space uh, alongside Plone now. So how are we going to integrate those two technologies together if we wanted to actually share content back and forth between them? There's different kinds of options here, or lots of uh, opportunities. But how do we control that, the web branding, the content, and the infrastructure? How do we give the consistent look and feel back and forth between these sites? Or how do we share the content from one site to another, like things like privacy policies, or if you have news items, or if you've got content that's related uh, among your network of sites, how can you encourage discoverability of that content between the sites? That's something you, that everyone needs to kind of plan for. I think it's important that everyone takes more or less an inventory of all the potential properties you have. You'll probably find some you didn't even realize you had along the way and see what the opportunities are to actually you know, provide a better experience for your end users coming to those sites. So who currently is you know, creating the content, who's currently approving the content, who's currently publishing the content, may not all be in the same group of people. They may be distributed across numerous, numerous uh, areas of your infrastructure or of your organization itself. So you've got this idea of centralized control and then decentralized control. There's two different approaches here. And I don't think either one of them is necessarily a correct answer. It's all going to depend a little bit on your organization and your situation. But really, the only thing that's going to be bad is not doing something about it, like not bringing them together in some way, either in a centralized one platform or in a decentralized way, which is actually kind of what I want to talk a little bit more about here today. So it may be tempting to uh, consolidate all your sites into one, one big basket, if you can. Uh, some organizations can do this because they may be a smaller organization or they have more people uh, available to do this kind of a consolidation. This, some of the benefits of doing this 
with this consolidation effort, is you can basically think of it as bringing all the lines of Voltron together and, and empowering them to act as one. Uh, you get the, the benefits of consistent branding, uh, the ability to showcase content across all the sites. Uh, but along with doing that, you get the, and also, like I said, theme consistency. Uh, you can each do, you can do things like integrated workflows. So if you have complex workflows that each of the business units may need to use, you get a lot more control over that. And you get the possibility of using like subsite flexibility. But that isn't always optimal. Uh, to get to that point, if you had many, you know, hundreds of distributed websites out there, there's definitely going to be some stumbling blocks and potential uh, issues you may run into, especially considering it may be expensive. We're talking about a lot of uh, time consumed. You know, web wrangling can be hard. Can you imagine trying and to get all the people in your organization or across multiple departments in your organization or across a whole university to start talking to each other and actually being able to uh, put each other into a single CMS. Uh, first of all, you have to do things like CMS evaluations. Uh, we're talking about the migration effort alone to, to get people out of one system and into another system and all the various manipulations of the content that would have to go on along that path. And then you're also going to have to deal with all the legacy systems. So if you had older systems that you needed to pull content out of, there's a lot of things you probably don't want to touch anymore. Um, I don't know if anybody's had that experience, <clears throat> but we've definitely seen older sites where maybe we didn't code it, the guy who did has been gone for 10 years, and uh, you're not sure what's going on under the hood there. And then you've got to train all your new users uh, on the new system itself, which could potentially be obviously demotivating and very polarizing, because you've got lots of people who are in various camps, and they're probably not likely to want to move off of one technology onto another. But there is another option. So much like we had the consolidation uh, model for all the websites, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the integration model of websites, uh, allowing people to keep their existing technologies the way they are. They're already experts in what they do, but how can we make them all work together? Think of this more as the, uh, the, uh, the Justice League. Each of these guys is really good at what they do. Uh, they don't always necessarily show up together uh, they probably all kind of work a little more alone, but together they, they form a, a big team, uh, but do work together. So the idea here is being able to share content across the various CMS platforms, from a clone to a Drupal, from a Drupal into a WordPress, and those kinds of things. So we've actually worked on this, this problem for uh, UCLA. We've got a couple people here who can probably talk a little bit about that as well, where we produced a project called PushUp. And Push Hub is this content syndication piece that allows us to perform a decentralized syndication of content amongst uh, existing sites. So all the content editors keep their own content. Uh, they, they can sync their own assets into this, this hub, if you will, and then actually showcase their content in other sites. Or the content um, curators from those other sites can now feature your content across the network of sites. So we feel it gives you more flexibility that way. So as I mentioned, you know, UCLA is using PushUp or has had this idea to, to bring PushUp to life because of a couple of big reasons. There's over 60,000 people at UCLA, and we're probably talking about hundreds of sites. I don't know if I can put you guys on the spot. How many sites do you think you have? <laughs> yeah, so they did inventory. They're saying it's over 600 separate web properties in one university. Uh, so I see that's the, but they have a central IT department who doesn't necessarily control all those 600 sites. So it's a very decentralized um, content management arena, but with a centralized IT trying to support them all. So they want to keep the freedom you know, of, of theming and branding each site with each department, uh, having their own you know, abilities and freedoms there. But they also want to allow those teams to share content across uh, from each other. So I mentioned we, we started on a project called PushUp. So what is PushUp? Obviously, we've been talking about. Uh, we did an implementation based on Pyramid using the ZODB as a backend. So I'll talk a little bit of tech uh, here, and then we'll kind of show some demonstrations of actual you know, PushUp syndications going on. But one of the key you know, aspects for us was to make sure we used and leveraged open technologies. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the standards, 
But these are all open source tools we brought together into PushHub, you know, such as the Redis for queuing up requests so we could make sure that things uh, kept flowing asynchronously through the system, uh, using feed parser, which in retrospect, we've had to fix bugs in, um, but again, that helps contribute to open source for parsing in feeds of content coming from the various sites. And then we actually use Solar to provide a, a search across the whole hub, so you can actually use it almost as a federated search amongst all the sites participating in the hub itself. So one of the standards that the push hub idea was built upon was the pub sub hub hub protocol, which is actually an open protocol developed by Google. And they used it for the Google Reader project. And it's still alive today even though Google Reader isn't. Uh, anyone here who's using a WordPress.com uh, web powered website is hosted on the WordPress.com infrastructure is using <laughs> pub sub hub hub on the back end. Uh, WordPress.com uses that to actually uh, accelerate when you post an article onto WordPress, it actually goes out and actively pings any of the content aggregation hubs and lets them know that there's new content on your site versus the alternative, which is, I mean, who, who knows what RSS is? Maybe we've all kind of used it in the past. I don't think it's got heavy usage these days. But with RSS, there'd be a polling, like the server would ask every so often, is there any new items? Have you got any new items? In the, the pub sub hub actually addressed this problem by actively pushing the notifications to those servers saying, hey, I've got a new item, you can come now, versus waiting for the you know, once an hour, once a day, you know, waiting for that content to get old. Because obviously, as I kind of talked about in the very first slides, content is king, and making sure your content is out there in front of people first is very important to a lot of organizations. So in addition to the PubSub Hubbub technology, it relies on things like Atom, which is you know, kind of a newer version of RSS that allows for syndication of the website content. Uh, it can do JSON. Uh, we use just plain old HTTP and then REST as an interaction between the site. So anytime a site pings another site, it's just talking over HTTP. It's using the REST protocol. And actually, I'll show an example of that here in the code, uh, which kind of brings me to my next slide. Since we, we're Plone people, and we've done a lot of Plone sites, and we've done our connectors for PushHub. So PushHub has two parts to it, the hub, and then the, the open source connectors, which actually talk to the various hubs. Using that connector <clears throat> enables you to have that faster response to uh, when new items are published, or when edits are happening inside the sites, or when a piece of content needs to be uh, deleted from the hub. So having the ability to, to make your own connectors is really important. This is where using standards comes into play. We, by using standards, making a push hub connector for Drupal, for example, is actually pretty easy uh, to do. So again, I never expected I would ever do this, but here is PHP on a slide in my talk at a phone conference. Uh, it, who here has used Drupal in the past? Anyone used Drupal? Okay, so a few people. And who here has built on their own modules for Drupal? Okay, so it, actually building a module for Drupal isn't that intimidating. Uh, I, I, for my first time, I did it as well. But basically, they have what are called hooks. And the hooks are just methods that you re, they use you know, just naming. Uh, that hook right there implements node inserts in the comment. That's the name of the hook that's going to fire. And so if you want your module to, to respond to that like node, which is basically a piece of content being added into Drupal, you just name it your product dot or under node under insert. And then whenever a piece of content's added, that thing just gets magically called. So it's all based on naming and thrown for error with typos and all kinds of craziness like that. But we've experienced the same thing in Plone um, along the way. But here again, it's really easy to, to basically wire up when content's added into the site, it checks for its status, and it checks to see if it's been promoted. And if it has, it calls this push up notify method which is really, not, again, not very long. I mean, we're not talking about a ton of complex code to write your own connectors to connect into the push-up te technologies. This is where the Redis piece comes into play. Now you've kind of noticed the second line from the bottom, the rescue uh, queue. So what we do is make sure that the sites can continue to respond to, uh, to connections for content or requests for content by queuing up that request and then moving right along. The thing that actually does all the work is basically a little job in the queue that says, picks it up, says, hey, I got something to do, go off and do the work. And this is all there is to that. All it does is use, actually, there's a PHP clone of the Python library called requests. 
Anyone here used requests? I should do a lightning talk on it if you guys haven't, because requests is pretty awesome. It really simplifies the interactions between servers. So all this is doing is picking up content off a of queue, taking it and using this requests library, this is the PHP version of it, and basically, where's my push hub? There it is, ping it with a little snippet of like HTML that has like the title and name of the site in it, and that's it. The Python version of this is almost identical. It's requests with the exact same like call syntax. I mean, the, the nice thing about this is that it's, it's very, very simple to duplicate one connector into another connector into another connector because it, it's, we try to keep that part as simple as, as possible. And this is basically the whole flow of pushing content from one CMS into the hub itself. And this is done in, you know, I showed you the, the Drupal version of it basically. So let's just see this kind of a little bit in action. So I've got four sites here that we're going to talk about. There's the first site, which is the big U site. It's actually a Drupal site. Uh, we've got the health system site, which is a Plone site running. And also there is the med school site. So we'll have the med school site running Plone. And then we've got a fourth site, which is the like a blog a doctor would have at the university called the doc blog. And that's running uh, Drupal as well. So we want to be able to show off you know, content going back and forth between all these various sites. So I'm actually going to start off with, uh, if you're using just RSS to publish content or put content into the sidebar on your site, so for example, if you'd gone into the Heart Center area of your site and you actually wanted to uh, put sidebars here with related content to the Heart Center, uh, you can see we've got the med school content coming in, that's an RSS feed. We have no control over what content is being put into that box other than what's being put into the feed from the site you're subscribing to. And if we actually wanted to bring in content from the doc blog uh, Drupal site, it has RSS feeds just like Plone does. And so all we do is add in the RSS feed in the standard you know, portlet way from Plone. And you can see here we've got the, the RSS feed showing up the articles coming from the blog. There are, you know, again, you have no control over what content's coming in other than what's coming into that feed. You also can't search for content that's in any of these feeds, like the word turkey from the doc blog, doesn't show any matching results. So the content really isn't in the site, it's just shown on the sidebar and there's really little control uh, from your standpoint of, over where that content can show up and what it can do. You also don't get immediate updates. So if someone updates that content, you have to wait for the next polling cycle, like an hour or once a day, if they were to update the description, for example. So actually, if we, if we did do that, so for example, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a, a push hub tile, so it looks just like the port list we're showing for the RSS feeds, except we'll have a little more control over the content, and we can actually bring content from multiple sites together into one box. So we can see here, we can actually configure our push hub portlet. We can uh, <clears throat> search for, for example, something related to heart stents, if we wanted to showcase that kind of content. Uh, we can search based on metadata like the page type or which site it's coming from or even specific authors if we wanted to limit down the search. So again, we're using Solar to power all the search going on here in the, in the behind the scenes part of it. And then we can just drag and drop over the articles that we want to relate just to this piece of content right now. So if we can reorder them. And then once we're done, we can uh, name the tile. So we had related content, for example. And once we save, the page will reload, and once it does, you should see the uh, two articles that we just picked show up right in the box. Now if we actually wanted to change these articles and put like a little description with the, the related content, uh, we can do that by editing the article on the site. So we actually have left the health system site, we've gone over into the medical school site, we're editing the actual piece of content itself and putting in a description, you know, standard Plone editing tools. This is another big benefit here is we're not using some third party tool, we're, we're actually using the native tools to edit content. We're actually using the workflows to show off, you know, putting content into the hub. And then when we refresh the page, we actually get the, the description that we had put in in the med school site over in the health system site. So the hub on the back end in real time, as soon as that site was saved, pushed the fact that there was an update into the hub, and then the hub let the health system site know that there was something it needed to do, which was go get the latest content. We can do the same thing for the other article, basically adding in the description again. And then we come back over into the, the health system site and refresh, we should see the uh, latest part of the content. 
So again, all very instantaneous. So to take this a step further is we actually want to be able to show off putting doc blog articles alongside clone articles in the same box. So the doc blog's running in Drupal, and here we're going to use that Drupal connector. We can see here we've got that uh, article from Turkey uh, that we want to actually say link right in between the two articles uh, on the HeartStent site. If we go over here into our search, again using the solar search on the back end, it can actually find that content for us. And then we can actually drag and drop it right in between the two clone articles. So here you get the opportunity to curate exactly what articles you want to see and then place it right in the middle. And once we hit save, page will reload and we should get our Drupal content aggregated right alongside the plum content. Now, I think the Drupal content has a little bit too long of a title, so I think we should probably go try and edit that content and then actually update the, uh, the, the post right here. So if we click on the articles, they take us over into the Drupal sites. Then again, we're actually going to use just the stock Drupal editing tools. We're not using any kind of extra add-ons to Drupal for editing the content or pushing the content into the hub other than what's happening behind the scenes with the connector. So if I actually wanted to change the title and, and shorten it up, I would do it in the standard content editing tools. And then once we save, it does the exact same ping on the background, it uses the cues, sends the pings to the hub. And once it does, the hub then notifies the health center site that I've got to change, and I refresh the page, and the, the title now changes. And that's all happening, again, in the instantaneous real time. We're not waiting for any kind of polling to happen. That all happens as, as we're waiting, as, as we click save, things all start, and all the machinery kind of goes off in the background and, and makes this all happen for us. Now what's nice is maybe you run into a situation where you need to actually retract content or bring content back down. So for example, that Turkey article is up here in this, this is a push hub portlet as well over in the med school. If we needed to bring that same article off of both sites simultaneously, we can do that using the workflow tools in Drupal. So we've got the push hub right now hooked up to the promote checkbox in Drupal. I mean, this is all up to the content management or content admins, how they want to hook it into their workflow. But we just use the workflow of Drupal to control where items, when items are displayed inside the hub. So once we click save, you can see that the entry has been saved. It's no longer promoted. And if we go back to the various other sites, it will then, as we refresh the pages, should disappear off med school. And if we go back into the health system site, we should see the same behavior over there. So if you had a, a emergency or a legal reason why you needed to retract some content quickly off of lots of sites, this is where this kind of syndication can really come into play is that you may not control all these other sites, but you do control your content. One of the latest things we've added into the Push Hub protocol is the ability to syndicate whole pages of content. So for example, on the health system site, we've got a research area, and if we wanted to actually bring in a full page of content from the, the med school, uh, maybe they're producing all kinds of content about conditions and treatments, and we actually want to be able to see that, uh, we can actually go in, uh, feature one of those articles from the med school site, come into the content uh, management tools of Plone, create what's called a push-up page, and for each content management system, we would just work it, it would work the same way as any other piece of content. You would search for that article, and then we could drag and drop it over. And once we click save, what's nice here is this becomes just like a regular page inside of Plone, except you can't edit it. Uh, it, but it still has workflow associated with it. It still has metadata associated with it. You can have published and expiration dates associated with it. So we actually still have to publish it or use the workflow tools you've set up inside the organization to interact with that content. What's really nice is the content is really content inside the system. So you can see here that the title doesn't contain the word uh, upside down stomach, like the UDS abbreviation. But if we actually search for it, we can actually see that it now shows up as a search result, just like any other item inside the site. If the hub is down, that content still exists inside your site because the, the hub and the site are is pulling the content into the site and saving a copy in your exi existing content management system. So you're not relying on the hub always being alive to see that content.
Uh, another thing we may want to be concerned about when doing this kind of full page syndication of content is with search engine optimization. Uh, you don't want Google to get confused between which page is the canonical source of your content inside the site. So with each adapter or with each connector people should build, they should make sure that when they're pulling content from a canonical source, that they put in the correct types of headers to make sure that they've got the right um, metadata being sent to Google, for example, about where the canonical uh, piece of content actually lives. So in this case, the Push Hub page can actually put in the canonical uh, meta headers to let Google know that this isn't actually the real one. The real one's sitting over here in, in another site, which is like the Met School site, for example. It also can do the, for example, like the robots no index. So again, that's, that's going to be dependent on the CMS and also your policy on how you want to uh, copy content from site to site. But something to think about when you're doing this is actually, you know, leveraging this to improve your search engine optimization by providing more links from relevant areas to the actual canonical piece of content. So if someone goes searching for the content on Google, they get the one you actually want them to have versus potentially one of these syndicated piece of content or one of these copies that are living off on one of your other department sites, for example. And not only does that work, you know, plone to plone, we've done the exact same thing with uh, the pages for Drupal. The privacy policy for all these sites actually lives in the main Big U site. So the, the top level organization can control their privacy policy, make changes uh, as needed. And you can see each of these sites has that privacy policy link on there. And they're actually all uh, linking back to a central copy of the privacy policy on the Big U site right here. So making changes to the privacy policy now is simple as making it change in one spot. Uh, so you actually edit it here inside of Drupal. Uh, we notice we you know, copied the six feet up privacy policy. Let's change it over to Big U. And if we go down to the bottom, we can actually add in another clause uh, talking about privacy and linking and advertising. So we can go ahead and paste that in there. And once we click save, the exact same operation happens on the back end. Uh, it pings the hub, lets the hub know there's new content. Each of those other sites that is putting that privacy policy on their site will immediately get the latest version of this, of this uh, privacy policy from the central source. So you have the canonical now version of the, of the privacy policy. So you see here it, the uh, big U is now changed. And we should have a clause 14 at the very bottom. And that's on the health system. And if we look over at the med school and refresh this page, uh, same thing happened here. So those all updated in real time in the back end and gives you that, that control over things like common things like privacy policies, uh, maps, locations, directions, things like that that you typically reuse over and over again amongst you know, hun potentially hundreds of sites. Another good nice thing is that it adapts to each of the styles. So we're really just bringing over the raw HTML or the content itself. Whatever you've styled each site up to look like will then now style the content coming into that site. So have you, you guys have any questions about Push Hub and what we're doing? Al, you want to use the microphone? Yes. So it's not going to be permanent or so, or is it? Because the, the, the copies are actually in the home, home site already. Actually, we maintain a copy of it in the hub as well. Uh, so each site has a, like an RSS feed of everything that's being shared into the hub. And the hub itself like subscribes to itself for the whole search capabilities. So for you to be able to search for heart stents inside the hub, the hub has to have all that content indexed someplace. And so the solar instance actually listens for updates, just like any other site would be listening for updates inside the network of sites. And so the content gets stored off in the hub and then indexed by solar. So it doesn't actually expire from the hub. So it, it kind of becomes a central repository for all the curated um, syndicated content you would have inside any site. Second question, as I wasn't here when you first presented I me. Mean, you might have caught over this. What if, so what if the content you want to exchange is not a typical structure? Right. In other words, the fields may be different. Is that kind of mapping capability within the hub that can field one, maps a field two, that type of thing? Right. 
Currently it isn't. Right now it's relying on Dublin Core, so the standard uh, Dublin Core metadata and like the body uh, text itself. <clears throat> That's using the Atom for the data exchange, we're using the Atom feed structure for data exchange. The latest version of PubSub Hubbub supports using JSON, which would give us more flexibility in accepting like, arbitrary metadata or arbitrary fields coming between the sites. So you could say, for example, bring over a profile, like a person's profile with like you know, name, credentials, you know, CV, you know, all these kind of fields could be stuffed into there. And then on the back end side, once this JSON transition happens, you'll be able to uh, dynamically set up schemas inside of Solar so we can actually use, the, for example, all the native field names in Solar uh, and as search terms. Okay, third question. What if there's the, the pipe broke? What, you, do you ensure that the transaction somehow get resend, you know? Right. Is that, is that atomic, in other words? You know? Yeah, so the, at each site, they're all running their own queues. So as content is put into the queues to be pushed into the hub, they'll be sitting in the queue. If it doesn't succeed to reach the hub, it'll stay in the queue until the hub is back or until the site reestablishes re contact to the hub. So again, making that asynchronous so that you aren't reliant on the hub being there for like the next web request to come in or for something else to happen on the site. It's not gonna block the whole site's operation. And also, once the connection is reestablished, then the content can be pushed into the hub. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's been really nice. Working with Redis has been really, really simple uh, as far as like the queuing aspect. It has been really easy to work with. Uh, to follow up on the different schemas, does Adam have a field for an image? Like, so your news item in Plone has that image field. Yeah. Is that something that you'd be able to push over to? That's Clayton, do you know on that one? Clayton also helped work on a lot of this. I don't know if Adam does necessarily. Yeah. Because that's just something that uh, we use a lot on our, on our sites with the, uh, you know, like the news portlet on the homepage. We include the images from that, so I could see that being a, yeah, a good sell. And even even at Drupal, I don't know if Drupal has that same concept. Of yeah, it. like the featured image. Yeah. So with the current sites, the imagery that would be inside the content is still linked to the original sites. So if I had the med school page with an image in it and I put it on the health system site, the image would show up, but it's really being hosted by the med school currently. Uh, we don't have any storage for the images or binary data on the hub right now. Right, you could just use the URL of yeah. the original image mm -hmm. in, that, in that feed. Kim. Sure. That's a great question. The question is, what do we predict the capacity of the hub to be when it comes to numbers of articles? Uh, I'm going to say I'm not quite sure because we have not run any kind of stress test to, to see the like, theoretical maximums. I'm going to say quite a bit, though, based on our just day-to-day uh, -day usage with it. Uh, the content being stored there is actually quite small because it's not the imagery, it's not a lot of binary files, it's just the, the text version of that content. Solar itself can scale out to a ginormous amount of content, and Pyramid obviously is very, very fast as well. Uh, so I, I don't have a good answer for you other than I think it could be quite, quite a lot. And, and I guess similarly, what do you figure the number of connections or response requests per second would be handled? Like, so how large a network of mm -hmm. sites? Of simultaneous sites and connections? I mean, as fast as the Pyramid server can can uh, handle the transactions. Uh, all, all the transactions are very small, like the pings, for example, the REST pings, you're looking at you know, a few hundred bytes uh, in the ping itself. The next part of the transaction, which is, is again asynchronous, is to go back and actually get the atom item from the site. So those can still happen pretty asynchronous. So you can queue up a lot of requests, potentially, uh, to kind of buffer it over more time. But again, you know, Pyramid's handle, can, is capable of handling you know, many hundreds of, if not thousands of requests per second. Any other questions? Now, I'll be around, and again, tonight we'll have the uh, crep con, so I'll be making uh, creps for everyone. So if you guys want to ask me technical questions, like while well, I'm making you a crep, um, I'm happy to, to answer uh, on the spot. And again, uh, see myself, Carol, or any of the other uh, stickies who are around, if you have questions about uh, push hub or any technologies we've been doing. Uh, we've got lots of 
uh, case studies swag up here on the front. So if you guys want to know a little more in-depth detail, there's some uh, more details inside the slicks up here. Oh, and we have a brand new site we just launched for the project called pushhub.io. So make sure you go check that out. Um, again, appreciate any feedback. Uh, if you guys want a demo, uh, like a more personal demo and actually get hands on with it, let me know. And then again, the, the connectors will be open source so that you guys can make your own connectors for all your own sites. Oh, thank you very much.